Such injustice. Such hatred. Such cowardice. How else could we describe the trials Jesus received? On five occasions, Jesus was declared innocent by the Roman authorities and still executed. This was the hour of darkness, the day Jesus was given to the darkness of this world, the day when he was given into the hands of sinful men. Jesus knew what this day would cost him because he suffered its terror at Gethsemane. His Father's will required that Jesus drink from the cup of suffering and death. The cup that would not pass by was filled with the sin and evil of this world, the very sin and evil that would crucify him. The scourging and beating that Jesus endured during the time of his trial added to the agony he suffered in the garden. The Romans, realizing that Jesus was too weak to carry his own cross, seized from the crowd Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to help Jesus carry his cross. Did Jesus carry a full cross? Probably not. The Roman process was to require the condemned prisoner to carry the crossbeam across his shoulders. Simon of Cyrene probably carried the crossbeam of Jesus. The Romans also forced two other condemned criminals to follow Jesus along the narrow road to Golgotha. The Apostle Paul salutes Rufus, the probable son of Simon of Cyrene, in his closing remarks in the epistle to the Romans. We can assume from this notation that Simon was converted by this incident. Luke notes that a large crowd followed the procession of the condemned. Among the crowd was several women mourning and wailing for Jesus. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Jesus quoted from the prophet Hosea his final warning to the weeping women. Jesus saw the doom coming to Jerusalem. He remembered the communal oath pronounced by the angry crowd shouting for his death. Let his blood be on us and on our children. Jesus cautioned the women not to weep for him, but weep for their children, because he knew that soon the streets of Jerusalem would run red with blood. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian and eyewitness to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, wrote, So the soldiers, out of the wrath and hatred they bore the Jews, nailed those they caught, one after one way and another after another, to the crosses by way of jest. When their multitude was so great, that room was wanting for the crosses, and crosses wanting for the bodies. According to church tradition, the path Jesus followed is a street in the old city of Jerusalem known as the Via Della Rosa. The route is marked by nine of the 14 stations of the cross observed by the Roman Catholic Church. The last five stations are inside the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Christians from around the world pilgrimage to these sites. There is controversy with the Roman Catholic Stations of the Cross because of the nine found along the Via Della Rosa, only four can be found in the Bible. 
The Bible does not make reference to Jesus falling three times along the route, nor does it reference a meeting with Jesus and his mother. The supposed meeting between Jesus and Veronica, where she wipes Christ's face with a silk veil, is based on church myth dating from the 8th century. It is believed that crucifixion originated with the Assyrians and the Babylonians and was systematically used by the Persians as early as the 6th century BC. Alexander the Great brought it from Persia to the Eastern Mediterranean in the 4th century BC and the Phoenicians introduced it to Rome in the 3rd century BC. The goal of Roman crucifixion was not just to kill the criminal, but also to mutilate and dishonor the body of the condemned. In ancient tradition, an honorable death required burial, leaving a body on the cross so as to mutilate it and prevent its burial was a grave dishonor. Rome also introduced a cruel prelude to crucifixion known as scourging. The flogging was designed to cause the condemned to lose a large amount of blood and approach a state of shock. The convicted then usually had to carry the horizontal beam to the place of execution, but not necessarily the whole cross. A whole cross would weigh well over 300 pounds, but the cross beam would weigh between 75 and 125 pounds. The condemned man was forced to carry the crossbeam on his shoulders, which were torn open by scourging to the place of execution. The Roman historian Tactus records that the upright posts were fixed permanently in the place of execution, and the crossbeams with the condemned man nailed to it would then be attached to the post. Crucifixion was typically carried out by specialized teams consisting of a commanding centurion and four soldiers. When the crucifixion was done in an established place of execution, the vertical beam could even be permanently embedded in the ground. Josephus records that the condemned were usually stripped naked and the soldiers assigned to the execution detail would gamble for the clothing of the condemned. The four gospels confirm that this practice was used with Jesus. The person executed may have been attached to the cross by nails, but usually they were attached by ropes. The nails used were tapered iron spikes approximately five to seven inches long with a square shaft three eighths of an inch across. The time it would take for the condemned to reach death could range from hours to several days, depending on the method of execution and the health of the crucified person. Modern medical theory believes the typical cause of death from crucifixion was asphyxiation. Since the whole body weight was supported by the stretched arms, the condemned would have severe difficulty inhaling due to the hyperextension of the lungs. The condemned would therefore have to draw himself up by his arms or have his feet supported by tying or by a wooden block. History records that Roman executioners could be asked to break the legs of the condemned after he had hung for some time in order to hasten his death. Once deprived of support and unable to lift himself, the condemned would die within a few minutes. Four soldiers would be detailed for each cross, and ordinarily a centurion would proclaim the nature of the crime on a white wooden board. Since Jesus was crucified with two condemned thieves, twelve soldiers with one centurion were stationed at Golgotha. The victim was usually stripped naked, and the garments fell to the lot of the executioners. However, church tradition states that Jesus was allowed to use a loincloth, but there is no historical evidence to support this assumption. 
The crossbeam was planted firmly on the ground, and the victim was laid down with arms extended, to which they were fastened by cords, and afterwards by nails through the palms. Then the transom was raised to its position on the upright and nailed, while the body was left to swing free until secured to the bottom of the portion of the cross. The feet were nailed through the instep separately, or both together with a single iron spike. There is discovered archaeological evidence that the nails could be driven through the ankle bones also. There, the body was left to hang in agony, sometimes two or three days, until death from pain and dehydration ensued. When the procession arrived at Golgotha, Christ was offered a narcotic, but he refused to drink it. Let it be understood, man sinned fully conscious, therefore Christ would suffer fully conscious. The Gospel of Matthew records that the drink offered to Jesus was wine mixed with gall, while Mark records that the wine was mixed with myrrh. The writings of Pliny and Seneca, Roman writers and statesmen, clearly document that the Romans gave wine with frankincense to criminals before their execution to alleviate their suffering. King David must have envisioned the horror of this day when he wrote, They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. The soldiers proceeded with the crucifixion, and they parted Jesus' garments by the casting of lots. This action fulfills the messianic promise in Psalms chapter 22, verse 18. They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Jesus now hung on a cross, elevated between heaven and hell, naked and ashamed displayed for the entire world to see. No compassion or modesty was granted Jesus. In nakedness Adam sinned, and in nakedness Jesus died. At this point, Jesus uttered his first cry from the cross. Father, forgive them, they do not know what they are doing. The first statement made by Jesus from the cross was an act of intercessory prayer. Jesus realized that the multitudes were functioning out of darkness and ignorance. He also realized that vengeance belongs to God. Therefore, Jesus interceded for lost humanity that God would forgive them for their sin. He was concerned only with the forgiveness of the people, not vindication for the crime committed against him. When the cross was lifted into place, a superscription was put on the cross, and it read, This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This was Pilate's announcement to the world of the crime for which Jesus was being executed. The superscription angered the chief priests of the Jews to the point that they demanded that the sign be changed to read that he said, I am king of the Jews. The chief priests realized that Pilate's declaration was a public scorn inflicted upon them because the superscription was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Human nature has not and will not change. How easy mockery follows political power. How easy it is to show contempt and derision to those who are weaker than you. On three previous occasions, Christ was subject to mockery before the horrors of Calvary. The first event was by the Sanhedrin and their servant officers, where Jesus was physically assaulted. The second event was by Herod's soldiers, where they mocked the regal splendor of Jesus. The third event was by Pilate's soldiers who mocked Jesus' kingly authority 
by pressing a heinous crown of thorns into his scalp. They spit upon him and beat him with the staff upon his head. Like hyenas smelling blood, the hungry pack circled for the kill. As if the murder of Jesus was not enough, those who surrounded the cross also mocked and berated him. The first group who mocked Jesus was simple strangers who passed the crucifixion site. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their head and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. These people insulted Jesus by challenging his deity. The second group was the chief priests, scribes, and elders of the people. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusted in God. Let God rescue him now, if he wants him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The chief priests and other religious leaders also mocked Jesus for his declaration that he was the Son of God. This statement by the chief priests clearly demonstrated the fact that they understood the basic premise of Jesus' teachings. There can be no doubt that Jesus did present himself to Israel as their Messiah. The third group who mocked Jesus were the soldiers stationed at the crucifixion site. The soldiers also came and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. The soldiers also mocked Jesus because a king would not be crucified. This form of execution was reserved only for slaves and lower class criminals. The last group who mocked Jesus was the thieves crucified with him. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Rome also crucified two thieves with Jesus, since he was perceived as being nothing more than a common thief. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us! It is obvious that both thieves were insulting Christ. But according to Luke, one of the thieves repented of his action and defended Christ. It is apparent that the other thief repented of his mockery and rebuked the other thief, saying, Don't you fear God, seeing you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Out of the insults that ascended to the cross, there came to Jesus' ears the plea of a penitent thief. It is obvious that this penitent thief believed in Christ as king since he knew that Jesus was going to receive a kingdom. This cry of faith brought the second utterance from the lips of the Lord. I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Several hours passed since Jesus was nailed to the cross. The apostle John approached the cross with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary, the wife of Cleophas, Mary's sister, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw John with his mother, this prompted Christ's third saying from the cross. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. 
and to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. It seems strange that Jesus commissioned John to care for his mother upon his death, since this responsibility should naturally fall to the next eldest son. When Joseph died, Jesus assumed responsibility for the care and spiritual welfare of his family. It was the responsibility of the head of the house to act as family priest. Then why didn't the care of Mary fall to her other sons? John wrote that Jesus' physical brothers did not believe in the ministry and Godhead of him. Therefore, Jesus wanted Mary to have a place in his New Testament church. It is obvious that Mary's own children would have contaminated her with Pharisaic doctrine. It seems apparent that this was the motive behind the commission of John, because we see Mary in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Jesus was crucified at the third hour of the day, at about 9 a.m. in the morning. The crucifixion scene should have been illuminated by the brightness of the morning day. Luke noted that a strange darkness shrouded the noonday sun from noon to about 3 p.m. for a total of about three hours. The failure of the sun's light cannot be attributed to an eclipse that would be impossible during the Passover full moon. It is unknown to what extent the darkness covered the earth, but there are ancient traditions and folklore that speak of a strange darkness which covered several places on the other side of the globe during this period in history. The folklore is found among the Druids and even to the Chinese. During this period of darkness, the Father put upon Jesus all human sin and withdrew his presence from him. God the Father could not look on sin, and all nature responded because their Creator was being consumed with the sin of the world. Jesus became the accursed of God because of sin. This event caused Jesus to make his fourth utterance from the cross. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus experienced the separation of sin, he quoted in a loud voice Psalms chapter 22, verse 1. Some of the observers, when they heard this statement, said, This man is calling for Elijah. It would appear that one of the superstitious, who felt the darkness was the sign of the messianic kingdom, ran to give Jesus some vinegar to drink. The rest of the observers stopped the man and wanted to see if Elijah would save him. John noted that Jesus' body coursed with raging fever. In order that scripture might be fulfilled, as recorded in Psalms chapter 22, verse 15, Christ asked for a drink. Later, knowing that all was now complete, so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. From the jar of wine vinegar, that was near at hand, one of the observers lifted a sponge to Jesus' lips with a stalk of the hyssop plant. Jesus received the drink so that his parched throat would be revived to utter in a loud voice the next triumphant cry. With all the strength Jesus could muster, he uttered his final words with a loud, triumphant shout. It is finished! With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
It is extremely important that we understand the depth of Jesus' statement. This term signifies the completion of a business transaction by the payment of the full price or the discharge of a debt by the complete payment. It is important we understand that Jesus finished his work. He paid the full price for our redemption and no further work is necessary. Therefore, Jesus is seated at the right hand of his Father. Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit, and in doing so, offered a final prayer. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Jesus is now dead. Christ did not die because life slowly ebbed from his veins. Jesus' life was not taken from him, but he died by an act of his will. Jesus dismissed his soul from his body. Christ was sovereign over his death as he was sovereign over his resurrection. This would have been about 3 p.m. in the afternoon when the Passover lamb was sacrificed on the Day of Atonement by the High Priest. Jesus and the Paschal Lamb died together. The strange darkness remained, but now the earth quaked with the death of its creator. The stones that would cry out the glory of the triumphant Messiah now trembled because of the holy blood staining the ground red. One could almost hear the sorrowful wails of God the Father looking at the lifeless body of His Son. The earth quaked because the Father grieved. Immediately upon the death of Jesus, the massive veil in the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. This veil was made of a woven material the thickness of a palm's breadth and was 60 feet long and 30 feet broad. This veil separated the holy from the most holy place. This veil was of such tough fabric and so woven that it could not be torn by an earthquake. This event could only mean one thing. The Spirit of Jesus Christ our eternal High Priest entered the holiest of all in heaven with the blood of the Paschal Lamb, with His own blood. Would God the Father receive the blood sacrifice of His own Son? The answer to this question would not be known for three days. The fact that this incident is known can be attributed to a great number of priests testifying about its truth to the first apostles. No doubt the rending of the temple veil and the massive earthquake are the same event. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. This massive earthquake not only split rocks, but also opened many tombs of dead holy people. And when Jesus rose from the dead, these saints also rose from the dead with him and appeared to many in Jerusalem. Imagine what must be going through the minds of the Roman detachment assigned to the crucifixion. This would be a typical assignment a Roman soldier would receive. This execution should have been just another day at the office, but was it? The centurion who commanded the detachment feared the strange darkness and the earth quaking beneath his feet. What could cause such strangeness? No man 
could cause the sky and the earth to quake and moan. When the centurion and those with him guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Only a God could shake the earth. This Jesus was no ordinary man. The Jews must be right when they said that this Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. No doubt, this Jesus was the Son of God. This Jesus must be innocent, because all of nature testifies that he was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all of those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. The religious leaders were scrupulous for the technicalities of the law concerning the Sabbath day. They desired to prevent the defilement that dead bodies would have brought to the area. For this reason, they sought to hasten the death of the ones crucified. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And, as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Dr. C. Truman Davis in his essay entitled, The Crucifixion of Jesus, a medical explanation of what Jesus endured on the day he died, wrote that, the legionnaire drove his lance between the ribs up through the pericardium into the heart, and immediately there came out blood and water. Thus there was an escape of watery fluid from the sac surrounding the heart and the blood of the interior of the heart. This is rather conclusive post-mortem evidence that Jesus died. Not the usual crucifixion death by suffocation, but of heart failure due to shock and constriction of the heart by fluid in the pericardium. John's declaration provides clear post-mortem evidence that Jesus died of massive heart failure. The truth is, Jesus died of a broken heart. Thus fulfills prophecy given in the Torah, in Psalms, and by Zechariah the prophet. Unlike the other disciples who fled for fear of the Jews, two courageous men now boldly identify themselves with Jesus. The intent of this pair was to provide a burial for Jesus. These men are Joseph of Arimathea, who was a counselor and member of the Sanhedrin, and Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews and a member of the Sanhedrin also. Mark also records that Joseph was waiting for the kingdom of God. It is evident from this statement that Joseph was a disciple of the Lord in secret because he feared the politics of the Jews 
until this day. Joseph and Nicodemus went boldly to Pilate and requested that he release the body of Jesus for burial. Pilate marveled that Jesus died so soon. Therefore he summoned the commanding centurion to confirm the request of Joseph and Nicodemus. When Pilate confirmed the death of Jesus, he released the body to these two men. Together, Joseph and Nicodemus went to the cross and removed the body and wrapped it in a linen cloth. The body was taken to the tomb, where the two of them wrapped the body with spices and strips of linen. Matthew records that Joseph of Arimathea laid Jesus in his own new tomb, hewed out of rock, and they rolled a great stone across the door of the sepulchre and departed with the two Marys. Jesus died with the wicked and made his grave with the rich in the tomb of Joseph. This fulfills the prophecy given by the prophet Isaiah. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was deceit in his mouth. Even though Jesus was dead, the chief priests called an unusual session of the Sanhedrin on the Sabbath day. The Jews remembered that Jesus had predicted his resurrection. Therefore, they went to Pilate and acquired a Roman guard to seal the tomb and set an armed watch. Chief priests and Pharisees took every precaution to prevent the fulfillment of the sign of Jonah. What concluding thought could be given to put this horrific scene into perspective? Only one thing comes to mind. What price would you pay to fulfill the will of God? Would you stand in Tenement Square in Beijing, China to preach the gospel? Would you canoe uncharted waters of the Amazon to carry the healing touch of Jesus? Would you stand on the street corners of Tehran, Iran, handing out Bibles? We all must search our hearts to answer difficult questions like these. The gospel has not spread without a price. The price of the gospel for Jesus was Calvary. The price of the gospel for the Apostle Paul was rejection by his national brothers and decapitation in Rome. The price for the gospel for the Apostle Peter was to be crucified upside down. In fact, with the noted exception of the Apostle John, all the disciples of Jesus died at the hands of evil men. The two millennia that has passed since that horrid day on Calvary has seen countless tens of thousands pay the price for the gospel. They died. These men and women died on crosses, on flaming stakes, by the teeth of hungry lions, and by the sword and the bullet. Blood of the martyrs is still flowing as the gospel penetrates new territory. Again, we come back to this one simple question. What price would you pay to fulfill the will of God?